Hello, everyone. Welcome to our next installment of the Washington Stay Home Society. Today is Suffrage History Piece by Piece, Storytelling with Collage. We are so excited to have you all joining us. And before we get started, I would like to say that we would like to acknowledge that the Washington State Historical Society is located on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people who have stewarded the land through the generations, and we pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. So welcome this evening. Thank you for joining us. I also want to acknowledge that this is part of our Washington State Home Society virtual programming with the Washington State History Museum. This is actually our eighth virtual program. We are so excited to be continuously bringing you all of these great speakers, our incredible partners, and today is no different. We are so excited to be talking about suffrage history and the artwork of collage. It's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you for being with us. Um, we haven't solidified the dates for all of our upcoming programming, although we will have many, many more Washington Stay Home Society virtual programs. So here is the link for you. We have a brand new, beautiful website. It is gorgeous. We are very excited about it. And it's much easier to kind of see all of the upcoming events and programs. So do follow the website. And then you can also continue to follow us on Facebook for any update on upcoming Washington Stay Home Society programs. Also, if you're so inclined and you would like to donate to ensure that we can continue bringing you this programming, think about donating at the link provided there. Feel free to also include information in the notes section that lets us know that you attended this program and that you really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for joining us. And now to kick it off, I'm going to be introducing our very special guest today, Elisa Law. I'm so excited to have her. She is totally incredible. And she's someone that you will be seeing more from in the coming months as we get closer to the actual suffrage centennial celebration that will be here in Washington state. So Elisa is our women's suffrage centennial coordinator and she works with the Washington State Historical Society with all of us. And her role is incredibly multifaceted. It supports all aspects of our state's suffrage centennial planning. So that includes, but is not limited to all of the things I'm about to tell you providing administration support for educational program opportunities, tourism initiatives, public programming, national commemorative initiatives, exhibitions, and grants to communities across the entire state. She does all of this. She is amazing. So welcome to you, Elisa, and thank you for joining us tonight. So thrilled to have you. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I, As Molly said, I wear a lot of hats, and uh, we've done a lot of really cool things in the last couple of years to uh, commemorate suffrage in uh, Washington. And so I'm going to share my screen with you and open up a little PowerPoint and just kind of run through really quickly some of the exciting things we've done and some of the exciting things we are doing and share them with you. Here we go. Let's see, here we go. Our beautiful logo. Um, so here's our logo. It's um, Washington Women Led the Way is our theme. And this will come up over and over again in this program. Um, you'll learn all the ways that Washington women led the way in terms of uh, suffrage as we go along. Um, but one of the biggest programs that we've done um, is our Votes for Women Centennial Grant Program, which was $150,000 that we gave out to 56 different organizations across the state um, in 39 counties. And so we had like pretty wide, um, a wide uh, a, a range of, of geographic regions who were participating in this program. And we funded exhibits like Wing Luke Museums, Hear Us, Rise, Asian Pacific American Feminism. We help fund the Legacy Washington's Moving Forward, Looking Back, Washington's First Women in Government exhibit, which was amazing. We helped fund the Washington State 
Jewish um, Historical Society's Agents of Change, which focuses on Washington's uh, Jewish women's stories. And then we funded theater programs in Seattle and choral concerts in Richmond and cycling events in Bellingham and interpretive panels in Edmonds, school performances in Pullman and women's veterans gatherings in Fife, and then about four dozen other programs. So this was our biggest and most, um, we're most proud of our grant program and all of the partners that we've made over the course of the last couple of years running this. And um, yeah, oh, you can learn more about it on the Suffrage 100 WA webpage. We have a press release that talks about all the different programs. But um, also on our webpage, um, what before COVID-19 was a really robust events pro and programs calendar. But since um, a lot of those programs have been postponed until the fall, um, that calendar is going to be uh, updating as those get rescheduled. Um, so stay tuned on that. But we also um, on our website and Twitter and Instagram, Suffrage 100 WA, we celebrate women change makers of Washington. We share kind of little um, today in histories uh, that talk about um, how our, our very long road towards um, women's suffrage in Washington um, and talk about our programs. Programs like these initiatives I'm about to tell you. Um, one of them is our um, Edits for Women initiative. So we were inspired to start editing Wikipedia after we went on um, looking for our Washington State suffrage history page to see what most people in the world are, like, what, are what kind of information are they accessing during 2020, during the centennial um, about women's suffrage? Like, what is it that they're learning about Washington? They're learning about, here's our page, but here's our page right now, before we started editing it. Um, of the 40 plus years that Washington women were fighting for the vote and of thousands of women who were involved in the movement, in our Wikipedia page about this topic, five men are focused on and none of our suffragists are women suffragists, which is like, we just thought that was, you know, that needed to be addressed. And so, we hosted our first wiki edit-a-thon at the History Museum. We had nine-year-olds, we had 71-year-olds, we had people who had never touched Wikipedia in their life um, editing for women's suffrage history. And they've added a lot of words, 900 words and 34 edits. And this is something that we are continuing to do for 2020, improving the pages and um, making changes to uh, articles about Washington women. So that you can also learn about on our website and how you can participate from home. Uh, another one of our initiatives is um, the Here Lies a Suffragist program. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but every year people visit Susan B. Anthony's gravesite on the East Coast and they put I Voted stickers on her grave as a, a, a to honor her, um, her legacy. And um, we were inspired by this, um, this movement to visit suffragist grave sites. And we started looking into Washington suffragist grave sites, trying to find them and identify uh, which, ones, which ones need repair. And we found out that this woman's grave site, this is Mary, Dr. Mary Olney Brown, Olney Brown. She was one of our first women to vote in Washington state. And um, she's one of our earliest uh, suffrage advocates. She said, I was looked upon as a fanatic and the idea of a woman voting was regarded as an absurdity. The law seemed to be in advance of the people. And she's referring to the 14th amendment, um, which said that all citizens are able to, to vote. And she's like, well, I'm a woman, I'm a citizen. I should be able to vote. And a lot of suffragists across the country were using the 14th amendment as a way of um, trying to exercise that right. But people were not letting them do that. And anyway, Anyway, we'll get into that. <laughs> so her gravesite, she's fought for suffrage her whole life. It's so, she was so into suffrage that it was written on her headstone. She was a faithful advocate of equal suffrage for women. And yet this is the, this is the state of her final resting place. It's cut in half, her name's not even on it. And so this is the, what the initiative is trying to accomplish is raising awareness of some of these sites and, um, hopefully making some repairs to these, um, these sites during uh, the suffrage centennial when we should be honoring um, the women who got us where we are today. 
So let's turn this into that. And here we've, this is not an updated list down here of all of this, the grapes that we've found. We have found about 115. Um, and so there's a virtual cemetery on Here Lies the Suffragist, which you can find on our website, Suffrage 100 WA. And you can see who's nearby you, um, what suffragist is nearby you, so you can visit their grave. We're also involved in national projects like the Online Biographical Dictionary of the Women's Suffrage Movement in the United States. Um, we have 57 small biographies written about Washington suffragists that you can find here. Um, that's, that was a grassroots effort, like volunteers across Washington have been write, researching and writing about um, our suffragists during the last couple of years. And so we were involved in this project, making sure Washington was represented. Also, the National Votes for Women's Trail, it's an interactive map of significant sites in the suffrage story uh, across the country. We have a couple dozen sites on there now for representing Washington in this national movement here. Um, and then national, another really cool national art project um, is called Her Flag. It's a woman named Marilyn R2. She is um, building this ginormous flag with a stripe to represent every state that ratified the 19th Amendment, um, of which there are 36, of which Washington is the 35th. So we're the second to last stop as she sews these stripes made by different artists. Our artist is Erin Shigaki. So she'll be, she'll be um, sewing Erin Shigaki's stripe on here and our next big event, July 17th, which will also be streamed. And more information about that event will be coming up soon. So keep an eye out. This is, oh, this is the flag. It's enormous and it's beautiful. And I'm really excited about it. Um, and then our exhibits, we had a traveling exhibit that has been to all these places. Uh, you can print it, you can download it for free um, uh, from our website. And so if you are working in a library or a school or have some office space and you want to like celebrate the suffrage centennial in some way, you can download this exhibit and pop it right up on your wall. And that would be, uh, I think that's a great idea. And then we have uh, our 100 years a Votes for Women 100 Years and Counting exhibit, which is our in-house show at the Washington State Historical Society, um, which is coming up as soon as we reopen again, whenever that is, hopefully soon. Um, and in the fall, that will be our big show. And it will be actually running alongside another show the uh, by the Northwest Collage Society, which we'll talk about soon. And then partying. Our big centennial celebration is coming up. It's, I can't tell you much about it. It's still, it's still in development, um, but it's going to be themed on the suffrage special, a train that came through Washington carrying 250 suffragists in 1909. Um, and we're going to be traveling through Washington and making eight stops. Um, and each of those eight stops is going to have their own program. And this will be all online and able for you to follow along with over the course of eight days leading up to uh, the Women's Equality Day on the 26th. So that's what we've been up to. <laughs> Woo! That's what we've been up to. And uh, yeah, should I open my video? Okay, okay. So that's what's up. And now I'm going to talk a, a little bit about collage and as a, as a way of introducing our illustrious guest, Catherine and um, the Northwest Collage Society, one of our partners for um, the Centennial. So here's this. Hi everyone, Elisa Law here again with the Washington State Historical Society, ready to combine two of my favorite things, suffrage history and collage. To collage along with me, you're gonna need some basic tools, something to cut with, some glue, a handful of magazines, and paper or some other surface to collage on. Ready? Oh, um, yeah. Before we jump in, we should know a little bit more about our theme, the suffrage special. In 1909, our local suffragists pulled out all the stops to get the vote in Washington. From penny posters to cookbooks, from summiting mountains to staging public performances, suffragists like Emma Smith DeVoe and May Arkwright Hutton made sure that the issue of suffrage was at the forefront of Washington minds. The most notable publicity campaign that year though was the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, which was to be a major world's fair with over 4 million in attendance. 
That year, both the state and national suffrage conventions were being held in Seattle right before the exposition. There were so many suffragists of note pouring into Washington in 1909 that summer that they needed their own train to get across. They called it the suffrage special and it carried suffrage leaders westward across the state from Spokane to Seattle. Eager crowds gathering at the major whistle stops along the train's route to hear the famous orators speak and to shower them with gifts. By the time the suffrage special had traveled through Spokane, Yakima, and Ellensburg, it was covered in yellow ribbons, the official color of the suffrage movement, and laden with baskets upon baskets of fruit and flowers. I imagine the suffrage special looked just like this and felt just like this. It was this huge celebration, it had so much energy to it, which is what I love about the suffrage special. Coming out and seeing this train with all these famous women and being like, try our cherries, try our apples, like try this, try that. You know, just the excitement around it is what I really wanted to focus on. So that's what I'm gonna do my collage on. I'm gonna start with all of the gifts that the Washington people gave suffragists as they came through. So I need apples, I need cherries, I need flowers. Um, so that's what I'm going to cut out first from my magazines. Next, I'm gonna check out our website, washingtonhistory.org and go to our collections and see what kind of suffrage related ephemera I can find in here. Let's see. Ooh, I love this Votes for Women flag. It's got that yellow color. That's the official, official color of the movement. I'm gonna save that to my desktop. Ooh, here's this nice like picture of all these women on a throne. I wanna use this map. It kind of shows that the suffragists are traveling across Washington. I'm gonna cut out this little train here from the Seattle Times article. I added a little piece of vellum paper, which is, which makes uh, the background a little opaque. It's not a science. You just gotta have to move everything around and see what feels right. Maybe I'll use this. Mm, maybe I won't. All right, Sammy's getting in my way. Pets wanna get involved. They wanna sit on your stuff. So I'm cutting everything out, you know, and it's not like a science. I'm not, I don't know exactly what I'm doing. The votes for women text and the train needed a little bit more color, so I added that yellow. Don't glue until you're ready. Now I'm just futzing. I want this Washington uh, text to pop out a little bit more from that vellum paper. So I'm gonna go ahead and trace that out and trace the outline of the shore just to make it pop a little bit. Yeah, I'm feeling okay about this. Hmm. Yep, that's me, that's what I did. Now it's your turn. Go to suffrage100wa.com, click on our galleries tab up at the top and you'll find our suffrage history piece by piece program. And then down at the bottom here, you'll find a gallery of um, helpful little pieces from our collection that you can use to print and cut out and make your own suffrage special collage. Find some suffrage ephemera that's yellow, some Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. There's those throne ladies, trains, everything you need to make your own suffrage special collage at home. And don't forget, after you've made your collage, to um, go back to Suffrage 100 WA and submit your work. That'll just email your work to me and I'll put it up in this gallery here. And don't forget also to visit the Northwest Collage Society's website and check out all the beautiful suffrage themed collages that they made. Thanks for joining us here and happy collaging. Where am I? I don't know where I am. Oh, I'm back. Hey, I'm back. <laughs> so that's our collage. Uh, I just had to get my swag on, you know, I had to, I had to just uh, tune out real quick and put my, put my, my sashes on and my hat on. Um, 
so that's it. That's that's our collage program. Uh, not the program. That's my little video that I've that I'm done doing. And um, I'm super excited to talk collage now with Catherine. Excellent. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and close. Perfect. Um, I will say that there are a few uh, Sammy fans in the crowd <laughs> today. There's some excitement over cats getting involved in Suffrage Collage. So, <laughs> and it's so exciting. So with that end, that conclusion with the Northwest Collage Society, I am super thrilled to introduce our next guest who is from the Northwest Collage Society, who is going to talk a little bit more about that organization, about what they do and about how they're involved with the Suffrage Centennial. So welcome to Catherine Y. Kim. Thank you so much for joining us. She is a photographer, printmaker, and multimedia collage artist. She often employs solar plate in her works, a medium that hardens upon exposure to ultraviolet light. Solar plate enables Catherine to apply her photography skills to create representational works, while collagraph and collage allow her to produce more abstract images. Her prints and collages generally reflect the ephemeral nature of our world and the important role that art plays in capturing and preserving fleeting moments of beauty and significance. Catherine has exhibited at various venues in the Seattle area and has been a member of the Northwest Collage Society since September of 2014. Thank you so much for being with us tonight and take it away, Catherine. You are still muted. There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, thanks, Molly. Um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you and Alyssa um, and the Historical Society and the museum for um, including the Northwest Collage Society in this big celebration um, and in this event. So we're excited to participate. Um, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about the Collage Society. Um, the Collage Society started off as the North Coast Collage Society um, back in 1984. It's been around for a while. It was previously affiliated with the National Collage Society, which is based in Ohio, but now it's an independent nonprofit social club. Um, and that's a term of art. It's defined in the National Revenue Code in Section 501C7. Um, and we have over 100 members. Um, and our purpose is to foster information and, and anyone can join. Um, we don't uh, we don't require anybody to apply or be juried in. Um, and uh, really, all that you have to do is express an interest, fill out a little form, and pay your annual dues, which um, are currently forty dollars a year. So it's a uh, it's a bargain. Um, and that $40 a year buys you um, an ability to attend five meetings a year. We have five meetings a year. Um, our year goes from September to June. So we meet in September, November, February, April, and June. Um, and those meetings begin with um, kind of general membership business. But at each meeting, we have some sort of program. Um, the program usually lasts between 50 minutes and an hour and um, generally is um, an artist coming and speaking about their work. Uh, most of them bring either um, a PowerPoint with uh, images of their work um, or um, and or uh, samples of their work um, that people can can see up close and personal. Um, we also have in the past um, had programs at our meetings which are more of a like a workshop, a mini workshop. Um, we had one this past February, which was all about marbling and we had different marbling techniques available um, and uh, folks could kind of experiment with that. Um, we have two or more exhibits a year. The exhibits are usually juried and they're usually members only. We've had um, some exhibits on occasion where we've opened it up um, more generally, even to people who are non-members. Um, but uh, these are generally members only. Uh, we have an online submission process. We use a program called Entry Thingy. And, um, and we usually have just one juror. Um, and oftentimes, somebody who has previously been a speaker 
will serve as our juror in some subsequent exhibit. Um, we also uh, have a um, year in February, we have a retreat. Um, it's uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's a weekend retreat and it's at the Warm Beach Camp up, up on the northern coast of Washington. Um, and that's a really fun way for folks to um, spend more time getting to know each other um, and do a little collage together. And um, people share techniques and they do demos and, um, and we all have every meal together and it's a really fun way to, to socialize. Um, we also sponsor meetups um, at various places uh, in the area. One of the most popular places is at Third Place Books up in Lake Forest Park. Um, and uh, uh, one of our members, John Arbuckle, um, runs those meetups. Um, and they are, um, I wouldn't say they're once a month, but um, they're pretty frequent. And he makes an announcement and folks can just come and um, doesn't cost any money and you can just come and, and bring your collage materials and collage with others. Um, the Collage Society also participates in the Shoreline Arts Festival. There's a room and a Collage Society members have um, ephemera and various uh, materials uh, with which folks can collage and, um, and then we man the man or woman, the, <laughs> the, uh, the room where the collaging is going on and, um, and uh, guys want it or if they wish. Um, and one other thing that we have been doing of late is we've been organizing a celebration of World Collage Day. Um, that's something that was started by Collage Magazine, which um, is spelled K-O-L-A-J, Collage. Um, and uh, that is a day in May every year. And what we've begun doing is having a postcard exchange. So everybody who's interested signs up and then um, there's a random distribution and you make your postcard and then uh, you get told who you should send it to and everybody sends a postcard to at least one other person and then you also get a postcard in the mail and it's kind of a fun way to celebrate that, um, that day and um, maybe uh, share collages with people that you haven't shared with before. So that's a, a bit about the Collage Society. Um, I could also talk a little bit about some of our past speakers. Um, I just want to kind of highlight a few. Um, they might be uh, names that folks who are um, familiar with collage know. Um, but Deborah Faye Lawrence has been one of our speakers. Uh, Larry Hawkins, he, um, he is uh, a very fairly well-known collage artist in the area. He um, does a lot of collage classes. Um, Dr. Greenwood, who's actually not a collage artist, she is the president of the Puget Sound Book Artists. Um, it's an organization based in Tacoma, um, but she's one of our speakers and um, talked to us about uh, handmade papers. Um, and of course, people who want a collage are interested in paper. And so um, that was kind of the link between her art form and, and being one of our speakers. Um, we've also had in the past Francine Cedars, who I don't know if you remember her, but she used to run a gallery. Um, she ran that gallery for 47 years and um, it unfortunately closed in 2013. But, um, but it was a very well known gallery and she was one of our previous speakers. Um, and our most recent speaker was Mita Mahato, um, and she is a, um, an artist who does what is called poetry comics. So she creates collages, but um, the collages tend to be in a, in a form of um, either a book or a comic. So there's a narrative to them. Um, and uh, she's, she's had a lot of success in getting published in um, different journals, including the Shenandoah Literary Magazine. Um, she has a piece in that magazine called Lullaby, um, which is about the plight of the killer whales. Um, and it's beautiful. Um, so she was our, our most recent uh, presenter. And um, 
her presentation was uh, online because we could not um, meet as a result of COVID-19. So we've um, retreated to online and <laughs> she was gracious enough to sit for an interview and um, agreed to have it recorded. And then we were able to provide that recording to our members. It sounds like you all are having all of the fun and have tried all of these different unique ideas out between speakers, exhibits, retreats, postcards. Um, I think that's $40 very well spent to be part of the Northwest Collage Society. <laughs> As I said, it's a bargain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, and speaking of exhibits being one of those components, what we're going to do right now is share um, the Suffrage Centennial Exhibition. That's their spring exhibition for the Northwest Collage Society. And we're going to talk about some of the pieces that are in there. So those of you that are tuning in, please feel free to type in questions into the chat. And as we kind of talk, we can share some of those questions as we walk through some of these pieces. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up the actual website. So this exhibition is actually online for you to view. Let me get that set up. And Len, who is on the back end, will be sharing that link with everyone. So you will know exactly where to go to find all of these online exhibits. But here is the website. You can see that it's the spring 2020 show, which is part of the Washington State Suffrage Centennial Celebration and all of these beautiful works. So we're probably going to explore about five of them and I'll just be asking questions because I don't know as much about suffrage history or about the art form of collage. But let's go ahead and jump in with our first work. It's titled, Golly, Look at Us. And Catherine, would you like to introduce this work? Sure. Um, and before I do that, I just wanted to give a shout out to Judith Noble, who's one of our members, and she is the person who put together this online gallery. Um, so I just want to give a shout out to her. Um, fifty word limit, um, and some folks said more, and some folks said less. Um, but uh, below. Um, the artist statement that Colleen Foy Bolin has provided reads, um, my collage process in order to support these women's oh, bravery. Catherine, we kind of lost you for a second. Um, you're kind of fading in and out with sound. Okay. Let's just double check to make sure that that's going. We missed most of that artist statement. Uh-oh. Let's see. Do you want to go ahead and um, reread the statement? I think you're back in now. OK. Can you hear me now? OK. So my collage process began when I saw the expressions on these two women's faces. <laughs> I placed other suffragettes behind them and a flyer outlining the reasons why women were willing to break societal norms and for their right to vote. The map shows how far suffragettes had come in gaining voting, voting rights and how much work still needed to be done. I'd like to point out um how many of these states um, that are cult, that are um, white or with um, little speckles that you know had the vote before this is like a vote a map of 1919. So this is right before the federal amendment. These are all the states that had already passed it, and Washington was you know 10 years ahead of the game. And we were called the dam breaker state for the reason that it, the the movement had kind of had a lull for about. 14 years, like people had, uh, suffragists had kind of gone into the shadows, at least in Washington state, our, our local suffrage organization had only like five members in it anymore. And then boom, the 20th century hit and we got new people on the scene and we passed suffrage. And then all these other states like felt like dominoes afterwards, boom, 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 boom. boom. So 
you know, that's kind of our little claim to fame that we're the first in the 20th century to pass suffrage. And that, you know, suffrage was a, a Western, a movement that took hold in the West, even though it, you know, the women's rights movement started in Seneca Falls in New York, you know, we, we here on the West really uh, like had it going. <laughs> I love this legacy of like being dam breakers, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> get those dams out of here. <laughs> um, well, can you talk, Elisa, a little bit about why would it be a, a movement that kind of starts in the West and then moves East? What are some of the reasons? Great question. Uh, there's a few different theories as to why uh, it took hold in the West better. Um, one of the reasons is, is that um, Western territories were trying to attract women um, and they were saying like, hey, we're going to give you more freedoms, more voting, we're going to give you voting rights, we're going to, you know, use that as a way of attracting women. And also, um, women who moved out West were super tough. You know, they were, they were bucking, or not bucking the trend, but they were, um, they were leaving behind all of the societal expectations like really firmly rooted in the East and in the South. Like they, they were charting their own course. And I think that maybe the men in the West respected their Western pioneering women um, for their strength and resilience and like, you know, physical, they, they did everything that men did in the West. And so I think maybe the distance from those societal expectations uh, of the time also helped um, change the perception of women in the West to be more fit for voting uh, at the time. Yeah. Love that. Such a fun legacy for us in Washington State, even though, yeah, we had the right to vote. We lost the right to vote. Had the yeah. right, but we'll, we'll get to that here in a little bit. Um, and Catherine, maybe you can talk a little bit about what you see in this work. Um, it's, I love all of the primary source material that Colleen used here. Yes, and um, you know, Colleen also um, provided an additional artist statement when she submitted this piece. Um, glimpses of everyday scenes from a different angle. And I really think that she's done that in this in this piece, um, particularly the the look between these two women, um, which she references in her artist statement. Um, she also talks about. Um, she says, "For me, the alchemy of collaging begins with a single image. Sometimes the final product has no visible similarity to the original subject." Instead, it captures the desired essence or quality I am striving to achieve. Many of my collages represent snapshots of an emotional state or perspective. And I think that, um, that that's really true about this piece that she, she's captured this sort of emotional um, moment between these two women and then, um, and then put behind it the, the sort of emotion and excitement of the crowd. It's really beautiful. Yeah. What a great work. All right, well, shall, shall we move on kind of a little, we're kind of moving a little chronologically and looking at some of these different styles of works too. So you should be able to see a really broad variety as we move through these. The next piece is called Oh, the Women, it has some of my favorite themes and stories from the suffrage movement. So this piece is by Claudia Mazzi Valheim, and she says, as part of their suffrage campaign, Washington women climbed Mount Rainier in 1909 and planted a votes for women flag at the summit. My collage marks this event, but instead of Mount Rainier, the women ascend a mountain made of suffrage posters and handbills. Um, I guess a couple of things that I would um, just also point out, there was another artist in this exhibit. Her name is Leslie Curry. She's actually our uh, membership chair. And she did a piece called Eaton's Suffrage Feet, which also celebrates this ascent up Mount Rainier. Right, because Dr. Cora Smith-Eaton was the leader of that summit. 
And that's kind of, that's her right there. And, and one of the things that Leslie says in her artist statement, which I, I, I think everyone got a kick out of, is that she talked about the list of supplies and, and what they took with them up the mountain. And the list of supplies included knickerbockers, smoked goggles, boys, wool socks, and cold cream. Can't go anywhere without our cold cream. But... <laughs> is that like something you put on your face at night? <laughs> What is it? Is it just yeah. lotion? Is cold cream like? Short I, I, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was a form of lotion for your for your face. Oh, okay. To keep you from, you know, getting wrinkled and starting to look older. <laughs> that is beautiful on that mountain top. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you'll see, like some of the earliest mountaineers, the organization, the mountaineers, women were organizing all of those expeditions. They were coordinating all of the journals about that on a quarterly basis, talking about all of the expeditions that they went on, writing poetry, writing descriptions, practicing ethnobotany. So I love that the thought that like they're still wearing, you know, um, dresses and all of these things up the mountain. They're applying the cold cream, which I assume is partially for like sun and wind protection too, especially on Rainier where that can, that wind can really, right. Right. you know, beat you down. But I just love thinking about this. Women are such a huge part of that legacy here in Washington state, kind of like exploring the outdoors. And it's great that we have all these suffragists doing it. Yeah, and did you know the, uh, in Bellingham, Catherine Montgomery, uh, who is an early teacher and a suffragist, was, is, like, came up for the idea of the Pacific Crest Trail. She's known as the mother of Pacific Crest Trail and she was a suffragist herself. So many badass women. Can I say that on this program? I just yeah. did. <laughs> um, I think also that what's nice is that juxtaposition between femininity and strength, that you don't have to give up your femininity to be, to be strong. And, um, and I really, I, I, I value that, that message. Um, going back to Claudia's uh, piece, Claudia actually has a website um, and there's a link here to it. Uh, and her um, blog is called Was Now Creations. And um, she likes to take old objects and repurpose them. So she does a lot of upcycling. Um, she uses um, old books and up upcycles them into um, cases and, and holders for Kindle or iPads or other devices. Aww. It's kind of a sampling of the kind of art that she does with the. Uh... Full disclosure, Oops. we were taking a look at this website beforehand and became very obsessed with all of this work. And clearly there's so much creativity with the Northwest Collage Society that folks are doing all of these other amazing things. Upcycling, so incredible. Mm -hmm. She has a blog about it, and she, and there's um, there's a lot of information on her website, um, some kind of tips and um, tips and tutorials. That's in that that second part of her website, the second link there. Um, yeah, I found that nothing is more, I and mean, nothing makes you want to collage more than going down like a an Instagram rabbit hole of collage artists. Like, oh my gosh, they just they go. It, there are some really, really cool collages out there. Um, so I'm talking about cats, there's the cat people portion of her site there. <laughs> I'm <hog> <laughs> <of> collages <laughs> without cats. Look at that. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And also cats are a suffrage theme too. So we're not totally off topic, are we, Elisa? Tell us about the cats. You know, cats, um, as you know, as pervasive as they are in our current social, like, you know, social media world and in our lives, um, cats were used to um, make derogatory statements about suffragists. They were used in cartoons um, to show like, you know, they, they, they represented domesticity and like, and like whiny, like, nah, like, you know, I'm a suffragist and I'm going to be like, like whining for my vote and like whining for my milk and like, 
so there's this also on our website at suffrage 100 wa there is an activity where you can uh take pictures of your cats and then turn them into um uh, these you know propaganda pieces from 100 years ago and they're quite fun <laughs> it is quite fun having done that with ninja per pants myself i would highly recommend looking on all of the all of this artwork and it's fun to just kind of think about women reclaiming all of that now and kind of like turning it on its head right yeah and then we had a comment um mizu who's one of um a member of our community advisory committee and she attends so many of our programs and actually was talking about how she attended the wikipedia wikithon oh, yeah. edit-a-thon um and how much fun it was but she commented she just loves the bold colors that are used in this work and it's yellow yellow themed love that yeah all right well, now let's talk about a different facet of the suffrage related history. We're moving to hero, Ida B. Wells. So this work is by Lisa Sheets. Um, and the first thing that she does is quote from Ida Wells, uh, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Um, so Ida B. Wells was a multi-talented writer, civil rights activist, organizer, and speaker. She was one of the founders of the NAACP in 1896. Among her many accomplishments, she fought for women's voting rights in Illinois and was responsible for women gaining the ability to vote in Illinois local and state elections starting in 1913. That same year, she traveled to Washington, D.C. to attend the National American Women's Suffrage Association Parade, where she was informed by the white organizers that Black women would not be allowed to march in the parade. So Ida B. Wells stood near the, spect the spectators along the street until the Chicago contingent marched by. And then she stepped into the parade and joined them, walking alongside them for the rest of the event. This brings um, an important uh, complexity in, you know, commemorating something, you know, the like something like the suffrage movement, um, which involved suffragists of color and I mean, from all backgrounds on all sides. There were anti-suffragists of, of all backgrounds and pro-suffragists, and um, there were, you know, tensions between these groups and, you know, the suff a lot of the suffragists that we um, often honor, like had some you know, racist uh, tendencies. Um, and like in this, the most famous, uh, famous example of that is at this 1913 Washington DC March where, you know, they asked all the women of color to march in the back and Ida B. Wells wouldn't do it. And she, you know, she marched with her contingency in Chicago for uh, the Chicago contingency, but you know, um, I think that, you know, it's important to note when you are talking about, you know, who, like, when women got the vote, even though the 19th Amendment um, gave all women the vote uh, legally, it didn't mean that all women were citizens at the time and could exercise that vote, or that women who were citizens, you know, women of color, if they were living in places like in the South, then, um, there were discriminatory practices for decades and decades that kept them from exercising that right. And so, you know, it's a continuous fight to um, get everybody the rights that they are supposed to have and like allowing them to, to use them. It's, it makes the suffrage centennial really interesting that way, right? Like it's, you want to celebrate the fact that women are finally enfranchised, but then there were so many women that were left behind just in terms of actual practice. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the ways that Lisa's captured that idea is by using the, the tissue, which is, a, which is a, from a dress pattern. 
um, and she's used the tissue to sort of provide this sense of obscurity. Um, um, so it's it's it kind of gives you that sense of a um, an incompleteness um, in the in the in the in what was accomplished by the Nineteenth Amendment. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I just I think the, the metaphor that she's used there is, is really powerful. It's an absolutely beautiful work. Um, I guess I would also mention um, about Lisa. She's she does have a website. I think it's going to be provided to folks who are viewing this program. Um, but she also was recently interviewed in connection with a work that she um, that she has that's in a upcoming issue of Cut Me Up magazine. Um, that's a magazine that literally wants you to cut it up because it puts out calls for artists. And one of the requirements of your piece is that it use um, components of the previous issue. So you actually have to cut up the previous issue to make your every process and decide which pieces are going to be in the next issue. And she has a piece in the upcoming issue. Um, and so she was interviewed about that. But what I thought was super fascinating was at the end of the interview, she mentioned that she's partnered up with Fine Art America to um, provide um, different products that uh, on which her art is printed. And one of the products on which her art is printed are face masks, um, which I thought was was um, really interesting in light of our, our current uh, situation with COVID-19. Um, and in that article, there there is a, a photograph of one of the um, face masks that you can obtain from on it. So cool. Uh, amazing. This work is incredible. The story of Ida B. Wells as a heroine in and of herself, incredible. Definitely worth learning more. And it looks like Len provided some additional links to learn about Ida B. Wells and also kind of follow along Lisa Sheets artwork as well. So let's move on. And Catherine, we're going to look at your work. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks for this opportunity to talk about my piece. Um, so it's called The Unfinished Business of Building One America. And this collage is inspired by the words of former President William J. Clinton. Um, and these were words that he wrote in a message to Congress in January 2001 on the eve of leaving office. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and read the words that are actually in the collage. Um, we were born with a declaration of independence that asserted we are all created equal and a constitution that enshrined slavery. We eagerly recruited laborers from Asia to help our economy, but in a time of war, forcibly removed Japanese Americans from their homes and into internment camps. Full voting rights for women were not secured until passage of the 19th Amendment. It took until 1952 for the Walter McCarran Act to extend full citizenship and voting rights to Asian immigrants. The right to vote is not only a sacred testament to the struggles of the past, it is an indispensable weapon in our current arsenal of efforts to empower those who have traditionally been left out, particularly people of color. So much progress from the passage of civil rights laws to the increase in the number of minorities holding electric, elected office is the direct result of citizens exercising their right to vote. We must do more to ensure more people vote and every vote is counted. Um, so these lines of text, which are um, in 13 pairs, mimic the red and white stripes of the American flag. Uh, and the iconic images of Fumiko Hayashida and Ruby Chow, uh, who was the um, 
first Asian American woman um, elected to be on the King County Council, uh, reflect the long arc that bends toward justice of which Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. often spoke. Much, however, remains to be done. And on the um, right side of this piece is inscribed additional words by President Clinton. Uh, there, his observation that America is people of all colors, united for the common good, working with their neighbors for change. And, um, and you cut I out that those words resonated even more now than when they were authored. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> I was just going to ask some clarification. You cut out each letter in the background of this collage. I did. They were all individual, individually cut apart from um, different magazines and then reconstituted to make the text that you I mean, see there. The feet of that alone in yeah. any color, but then to also do it and find them all in red. Yeah, <laughs> lots of Time Magazine and other magazines, but um, uh, yeah, I decided to go with red and I had to cut up a lot of magazines. <laughs> Are you like placing each one with like a, like a pair of tweezers on a little dab of glue? Like, yep, each, yeah, one's, okay. <laughs> each one's individually placed. It's hours and hours of work, um, but it was um, cathartic in a lot of ways because I felt very inspired by the by the words, and um, so it kind of gave me a relationship to the words that was um, um, sort of very very physical, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right. It's doing the physical practice that reinforces like each letter, each part of that word that then makes up that whole kind of tapestry. It's just really beautiful. Thank you. And um, Mizu, who's following along right now, also commented that she's appreciative of the fact that it's specifically Fumiko and Ruby are uh, Washington women of Asian American descent and to have to have those stories represented from our state. It's powerful as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's another collage um, right next to yours that has a similar focus. Um, like it talks about like when, or it talks about when folks were uh, like Native American women and Asian American women were able to to vote um, this Lynn Scordall piece. I thought was really uh, really telling of like whose voices were were unsilenced politically and when Washington maybe being 1910 and then and then uh, and, and then not till 1924 where uh, Native American women um, able to have citizenship and then not till the 50s were Asian American women able to vote and then um, the Civil Rights Act in the 60s, um, that that was when uh, the discriminatory practices uh, were largely, that largely eliminated but not completely. And so uh, it's a history that we like, as we've mentioned, we can, can continues to this day. It's, it's interesting too because um, Although there's this reference to the Warren McCarran Act um, from 1952, and it and it might seem as though that act was um, um, aimed at uh, and liberating folks. In fact, um, that act was really aimed at um, uh, creating quotas for um, different groups of people and limiting immigration. Um, and President Truman, who was president at the time, thought that it was discriminatory and he vetoed it. And then um, Congress had enough uh, support for the was that they overrode his veto. 
and passed the act. But um, subsumed within the act was um, uh, legislation that eliminated uh, laws that had previously prevented Asian um, immigrants from becoming naturalized citizens. That, um, that eliminated a barrier for Asians to, to be able to become citizens and, and then vote. So it's, it's a kind of an interesting mixed legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Asian American history in our country and in our state specifically, it's such an interesting winding road and kind of having to explore how complex that is and how there's a lot of misconception even um, about the Japanese American community that um, discrimination started with Pearl Harbor. Just like if you actually look back, we have this legacy of alien land laws where people aren't allowed to own land or become citizens. And um, so it's, it's not just like linear, right? It's just like there's all of these kind of mixed components that are explored. And I love that collage kind of like allows us to look at that complexity and kind of explore it through art. Mm -hmm. As you get that juxtaposition, you can um, um, play with how, how things are added or subtracted. Yeah. Well, and someone had a question for you, Catherine, in your work. Do you have any specific go-to magazines where you can find things like all of these letters or different <laughs> images, like which magazines do you seek out to create your craft? Um, well, I, I use a lot of Time Magazine. Um, the, the nice thing about Time Magazine is that they often have, um, they, they break out, um, quotations or segments from their their article and then highlight them within their their pieces and they give them they they give them color so they'll either highlight in blue or red or you know sometimes other colors um, and so um, uh, it's a nice way to be able to get sort of larger type letters um, in a particular color um, and, uh, you know, I know that there's other collage artists that have favorite magazines because of the way that the magazines are printed, that mm -hmm. the print process gives them a little bit more archival quality or that, they, um, that they're on a, a little stronger paper, a little, little heavier paper, so they stand up better to um, the types of adhesives that folks use. Um, I know that uh, I think Martha Stewart's magazine is um, paper and, and with a little uh, nicer print quality so that it holds up when you slather um, any kind of wet adhesive on it. Um, I think, you know, Life magazine's probably also um, got a little bit uh, better um it stands up a little bit better to uh to the collage process um i had mentioned earlier about mita maharu our our most recent speaker and what she uses is just regular newspaper and um one of the things that she likes to do is use the um color advertisements that are in newspapers and then cut up the the colored advertisements um, to make um, the the traditional type that you see in newspaper, so that you get a juxtaposition of it's white, but it's that you know, that newsprint color, um, that black and gray, I guess. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I think it just depends on what, um, what effect you're, you're after, what, what type of material that you would use. Um, I, I also uh, add text um, to works 
through other printmaking methods um, where I actually um, figure out what I want to say and then print it. That was my that question. Was, my was uh, wondering if, like, we are encouraging folks to go to Suffrage 100 WA to uh, print out from our, you know, online collection, print something out and then make a collage out of it, um, rather than, you know, the found materials. Is there um, any thoughts that collagers have, you know, ver like, with these, like, real materials, real found material collages versus, like, you know, printing like finding it somewhere and printing it and making you know like it can't always be easy to find like real ephemera to work with and cut up so you know there has to be a, some amount of copying and paste you know copying and printing i imagine yeah i i well i there's a there's a lot to unpack there in your question um i think one of the big concerns for collage artists is is um copyright and so um, when you're using found objects, things where you've actually purchased the magazine and you're cutting out of the magazine, um, there's not as much of a copyright concern because it's material. Um, and for example, Time Magazine can't come after me for cutting up their magazine <laughs> and using it in my collage. Um, whereas if I photocopy their magazine and then cut up the photocopy and use it in my collage, then I, which is to reproduce their work without their permission. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think collage artists are very sensitive to that um, concern and to the extent that they want to um, um, exhibit their work for sale and, you know, generate proceeds from the sale of their work, they, they have to be careful about not violating copyright laws in that in that way. Um, and of course, if you're talking about materials that are beyond the protection of copyright because they're of their age or because they were anonymous to begin with, um, then that's not as big of a concern. Um, but you still also have to be concerned about the way in which you print it. Um, you know, inkjet printed uh, documents are not all that archival. So if you collage with um, inkjet printed materials, um, you might expect that uh, the image is gonna fade over time. Also, it, it can bleed if you use a, a water-based adhesive. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I've had that happen. I'm sorry? I've had that happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why is this happening to me? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I think folks might have a little bit better success with laser, but then of course, if you're looking for color, um, color laser printing is tremendously expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's probably not the most economical way to, to be um, trying to generate materials with which mm -hmm. to collage. Uh, so, you know, like I said, lots to unpack in that question. Um, but uh yeah I think, yeah thank you for, yeah. for doing it. it's it's a complex question i didn't even think about copyright <laughs> um, shit, i always like collage is a new form of art and like it has protected because it's it's an amalgamation of it's a new thing um but, but if you've made a copy in order to use the copy in your collage then you've already even before you've collaged it you've already done something you've already copyrighted print <laughs> right you've already done something that you shouldn't have done so um so you just have to be careful in in how you choose your materials and and then you know what you're trying to incorporate in the collage i am but, learning so much about <laughs> i mean i didn't expect to be talking about copyright law in our <laughs> like, suffrage and collage but this is like so fascinating things that i would have never considered either well, I think a lot of the materials that the museum is making available, um, my, my understanding is that the museum is is um, giving permission for folks to use whatever's in their, uh, yeah. In their yeah. collection. <laughs> we so, are not setting you up to like come after you for copyright. Right, right, <laughs> like, right. Hey, I saw you made like this, all these people <laughs> suffrage, suffrage collages and now, now you're gonna pay. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> 
But also, I think a lot of the materials are beyond the protection of copyright because they're over 75 years or over 100 years old. So, yeah. Yeah, what, we might look at a different program to explore that <laughs> the ins and outs of copyright some other some other time because I know that's something small historical societies need to be thinking about a lot as well. But um, speaking of different materials and materiality, this piece we vote is just beautiful. It is. Um, so this is by Nancy Meldahl and it's called We Vote. And what she says about it is, bold, hot, pink letters proclaiming we vote set the tone for the women wearing hats from various decades of the past 100 years. Check marks over mouths emphasize she now speaks with her vote. Mm. Maps. And what better way of of honoring the legacy of suffrage and the suffrage centennial. There's no other way, no better way to honor the work that suffragists have done and feminist activists have done throughout this, this last century than to use the vote that you, that they fought for to get you. So yeah, I, just, I want to make a t-shirt out of this. <laughs> and then I need to explore the copyright um, of that. Well, <laughs> uh, you can certainly reach out to Nancy and see what she thinks. Um, the uh, I think that the the um, the reproduced image here on the on the website um, doesn't do the piece a hundred percent justice. Um, the, the papers that she used, particularly the hot pink paper, has a texture to it, which you can't really, you can't really see well in this, in this digital reproduction. Um, mm -hmm. So this is one of those pieces that I think would be worth a, a look in person. I'm um, noticing now that you've called out the texture, all the hats and, and, and uh, hair and everything has pretty interesting texture going on. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've seen other of Nancy's work and I would say that she has a very distinctive style. Um, and, and this is fairly representative of her style of work. Um, she's beautiful stuff. <laughs> Yeah. There's so much detail to it. And it's so interesting because at first glance, it looks so simple. But the more time you spend with it, you just see all of these like additional details, like all of the materiality. I love there's kind of like exclamation points like throughout, which is like this whole theme, like not only are we going to vote, we're going to vote. <laughs> like Here we come. Like we are voting with our mouths and we are loud and we're saying it. And you're, don't be fooled, we're not giving it back. <laughs> just such a beautiful work. And really all of these pieces are just worth spending time with. It's just a really, really beautiful exhibition. And spending time not only with the work itself, but the sentiment behind each one of these pieces is just really, really beautiful. Yeah, I, I, I think um, folks, um, well, first of all, Alyssa came and spoke to us in September and generated a lot of interest in this exhibit <laughs> and, uh, and Ooh, educated way, us. I was laughing and having a great time. I really was digging the vibe of the Northwest Collage Society, like really digging it hard. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, and uh, Alyssa was a great speaker and, and energized all of us. Um, so I think that we had a, a, a nice turnout in terms of um, folks creating work and, and submitting for the exhibit. Um, and I just want to thank Alyssa for reaching out to us and, and inviting us to participate um, and then um, working with us to, to make it happen. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks back at you for doing all the heavy lifting. Of you know, getting everybody to, to get involved. Um, it's been a pleasure. I love collage. I was, I think I was at the height of my collaging 
when I took on this position. And so I was like, we got to get collage involved. <laughs> you know, I had my own, you know, passionate reasons. I have to say, it's, it's so fun to see this really elevated collage style because I came at it during COVID like, well, I've got magazines. I'm going to try some collage myself. But I did find I was very limited when I only have magazines like museum and archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> so it got dark really quickly with like images of the plague and <laughs> all sorts of things. But I find these very, very inspiring. So thank you so much for sharing them. They're really beautiful. Oh, and then Alyssa, I wanted to make sure I mentioned um, that Peggy from the Northwest Railway Museum was also saying how excited they all are to be sharing the exhibition there. Cool. So it's been, I have to say, it's been so much fun having Alyssa just kind of manage all of the Suffrage Centennial partnerships because we might not have gotten to work with you, Catherine, like at the Northwest Collage Society without all of Elisa's work and kind of connecting with all of these different groups all across the state and exploring history in these unique ways that we don't often get to. So this has been really fun for all of us, even like in the background and getting to be part of the programs and the exhibits and the grants and all of the hard work that's happening across the state as we lead up to the big event, the big suffrage centennial. Anything else that you can like give us teasers about with that, Elisa? Oh my gosh. Well, um, I would say to stay tuned with our faith on our Facebook, um, which it seems like anybody who is watching this now is already there. So make sure you're following and um, maybe follow Suffrage 100 WA on Instagram. That's like where we push out the most info projects and thing, uh, artworks and things. Um, coming up in August, we'll be releasing those eight that eight video series from all across the state one by one as like the, the suffrage train travels from Spokane to Olympia. Um, yeah, stay tuned for it. We're, we're doing a lot of work on it right now and our partners are super excited and they have all these great ideas and it'll be like kind of a combination of, of a culmination of all the things we've done up until this point, like just like coming at you for a whole week, a dedicated week. It'll be really cool. It's amazing. So everyone's homework in the meantime, before the big event is to go online, check out all of these sites. So go to the Northwest Collage Society, be inspired by all of those works, and then start creating your own collages based on what you've seen tonight and make sure you submit those so we can start sharing those. Submit them, submit them. <laughs> be sure you do that. And um, also kind of learn about what's going on in your area of Washington state as well. There's so much interesting history across the whole state and maybe you can share some of your local stories and get ready for the special to stop in your area. It should be really fun. So thank you, Catherine. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I have learned so much about collaging and about your organization, which sounds like so much fun. I can't wait to look more into the Northwest Collage Society. And Elisa, thank you so much for sharing everything about the Suffrage Centennial. It's been so much fun to hear about all of the projects that you've been working on. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We've been thrilled to have you. And do be sure to check back um, here on our website, our brand new website, as I mentioned, we'll have all of our upcoming Washington State Home Society programs. Be sure to check the website and the Facebook page. And if you enjoyed this program, please consider donating, becoming a member. Um, we would love to have additional support to ensure that we can keep these virtual programs coming to you while you stay safe at home. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight and we will see you next time. Thank you. Huzzah. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>